To support our discussions with the world's leading thinkers, please see the video description or visit eism.eu forward slash support. Thank you. Hello and welcome to A Theory of Everything. I'm Luis Razo, the director of ASIM and host of this channel. Today we're talking to Dr. Judith Curry, an American climatologist and former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the Georgia Institute of Technology. You'll have to forgive me for the clickbaity title, but there's actually a good reason for it. On the surface, today's discussion is about climate change, and one of the fruits is the challenge issued by Dr. Curry, a so-called climate denier, to climate alarmists in general and to Lawrence Krauss specifically. For those who don't know, Krauss is a prominent theoretical physicist and a public intellectual. He's also a previous guest on the channel who wrote a recent book on climate science. I think you'll be struck, as I was, by the combination of Dr. Curry's impressive academic credentials and the confidence with which she issues her challenge. In my view, her claims merit a response, and I hope we can eventually get a taker, whether Lawrence Krauss or somebody else. However, the most important takeaway here is not on disagreement, but rather on the agreement. Curry is abundantly clear, as is Krauss, that ultimately what we're dealing with here is a political question. How are humans going to resolve our different takes on science without eventually destroying ourselves? That ultimately is the heart of the issue, and it's one on which the long-term survival of humanity depends. It's one thing to have an opinion, and it's an entirely different thing to propose a better way to resolve our differences of opinion. These two things, having an opinion and proposing a better way to resolve differences of opinion, belong on completely different levels of abstraction. And the second question is much, much more important. It's the difference between a group of people not being able to decide what to have for lunch and the same group debating on whether to vote or draw straws or play rock, paper, scissors to settle the differences. This second question of how to make collective decisions is studied formally in a branch of economics known as social choice theory. You'd be surprised how many otherwise very intelligent people don't pay even the slightest attention to this critical science. I hope you'll reflect on this because ultimately this is why this channel exists and this is why we have these discussions. We're not just another YouTube channel and we're not here to entertain. Today's lesson is an important one, but it's not primarily about climate change. Don't get it wrong. The most important lesson here involves science plus social and political will, or science and management. And that's where ASIM is a global pioneer. We've started with fundamental physics and we're working our way through all of the branches of knowledge. Our mission is to change the way the world makes decisions before it's too late. So I hope you enjoy my exchange with Dr. Curry, but I also hope you don't lose focus. As always, you'll find a timestamp and relevant links in the video description. Thanks for sharing your thoughts in the comments and thanks for your continued interest and support. Hello and welcome to A Theory of Everything. I'm Luis Razo, the director of ASIM and host of this channel. Today we're talking to Dr. Judith Curry, an American climatologist and former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Curry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. Well, my pleasure. I look forward to our conversation. Well, doctor, if it's okay, I'd like to start by telling listeners about your professional background. Um, so Dr. Curry graduated cum laude from Northern Illinois University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography. She then earned a PhD in Geophysical Sciences from the University of Chicago. Her research interests include hurricanes, remote sensing, 
atmospheric modeling, polar climates, air-sea interactions, climate models, and the use of unmanned aerial vehicles for atmospheric research. She was a member of the National Research Council's Climate Research Committee and has published over 100 scientific papers and co-edited several major works in climate science. Dr. Curry served on the NASA Advisory Council Earth Science Subcommittee, whose mission was to provide advice and recommendations to NASA on issues of program priorities and policy. She was also a member of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Climate Working Group from 2004 to 2009, a member of the National Academies of Space Studies Board from 2004 to 2007, and a member of the National Academies Climate Research Group from 2003 to 2006. As you can see from these, um, this description that Dr. Curry is obviously a, a very uh, accomplished uh, climate scientist. She retired from her university position in 2007, partly because of what she described as anti-skeptic bias, which she attributed at the time to the political nature of climate science. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today, the very tricky relationship between science and politics. In fact, Dr. Curry, uh, the primary focus of this channel, or one of the primary focuses of this channel, is on the science of effective management, which is, which is tricky. In your case, you often talk about something that the, mass, the vast majority of people um, will agree with, and I'd like to place that at the center of our discussion. And that's the idea of human flourishing. Most people at any point on any political or ideological spectrum seem to agree that human flourishing is the ultimate goal. And you've stated, if I've understood correctly, that human flourishing is ultimately what drives your work. Can you say a little bit more about that and maybe about why you think that something that everybody agrees on can become so complicated? Well, I'm not sure everybody agrees on that. Um, some people want, you know, think that the answer is fewer people and more poverty. So we use less resources and don't impact the environment. So that, that's sort of an environment first kind of approach. Can I take the people first approach? You know, I want to see prosperity and, and human development for all the world's countries and all the world's peoples. Now, there are a lot of things that get in the way of that. Um, you know, the environment is just one relatively small factor, and the wealthier a country is, the smaller the factor of the environment is because you have enough money to figure out how to cope with it. But in less developed countries, they're very vulnerable to the environment. Um, their development is often um, hampered by poor governance and corrupt leaders. So it's difficult to make headway. But when we're talking about the climate change problem, to me, there is no way that a solution of not allowing Africa to develop its fossil fuel resources can be regarded as ethical or just. I, I mean, that that's just something that makes no sense. And you, you know, it's just two fundamentally different outlooks. So I'm not sure everybody agrees that human thriving is really the goal. There are a lot of people that say, well, there should be fewer people. And, and if people didn't use so many resources and whatever, the world would be a better place. So it's the, you know, just two different views of humans relations with their environments. You know, one is that we, that we rely on the environment for our sustenance and we have to take care of our environment. And the other one is that, you know, we can survive, you know, that we can engineer our environment to make it work for us. You know, we don't wanna trash it, um, but the, you know, the earth is a vast place with many resources. Let's figure out how to, how we can best use this for human thriving. Okay, well, 
To be honest, that's kind of news to me that there are a lot of people, I suppose we have to quantify a lot of people who think that less, uh, or that the environment is more important than humans. My guess is that there's not, the majority of people do not have this concern, or, or do you have different information than I've been able to? to well, it, to? there's very strong academic heritage in philosophy and environmental science you know, along those lines. Um, the, the UN, <laughs> the UN policies from the environmental program um, and even the Paris Agreement, they do not put human development first. <laughs> They're putting reducing carbon dioxide emissions first. Okay, a lot of the programs that were UN, you know, World Bank and whatever to help low income countries develop and reduce their vulnerability to climate change, those resources are being redirected to help mitigated CO2 emissions. So, I mean, there are some big international worldwide policies that are do not seem to be focused on human thriving, at least in the near term. Okay, but, but if I understand, the this these policy initiatives correctly the ultimate goal or the concern about co2 levels is not the co2 levels themselves but rather their impact on human flourishing have i gotten it wrong well yeah i mean this is the weakest part of the argument okay is more co2 in the atmosphere dangerous they haven't really made that case very well um it's tied to extreme weather events, which have always happened, will always continue to happen. It's very difficult to disentangle the role of natural weather and climate variability, land use, and the slow creep of <clears throat> global warming to try to attribute any of the problems that we're having to increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The slow, Warming does produce a slow creep of sea level rise, but um, it's slow. It's been, you know, the sea level has been rising most recently since the mid 19th century at relatively slow rates. Um, certain people predict that this could rapidly accelerate, but, you know, it hasn't been happening. You know, anything catastrophic with sea level rise such as the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet is more likely to be associated with under ice volcanoes than it is to CO2 in the atmosphere. So this whole issue of danger is the weakest part of the argument. And they, they try to get around that by blaming everything, Pakistan floods, Hurricane Ian, everything on climate change. Well, well these severe weather events would have happened um, independent of climate change. And if you look back to the early part of the 20th century, you are always going to find worse extreme events than what we've seen in the last 10 years. And if you go back even farther using paleoclimate records, you see some really awful, I mean, extreme events. In the US, I mean, the worst weather by any standard, heat waves, fires, floods, hurricanes, everything occurred in the 1930s. I mean, nothing comparable to what happened in the 1930s have we seen in the 21st century. Did the US weather in the 1930s, did that relate to fossil fuel emissions? No. So, you know, that there's a very um, weak argument in trying to present all this as dangerous. Okay, well, we recently talked to Jeffrey Sachs, the, a professor at Columbia uh -huh. University and a widely respected global authority on sustainable development. He's twice named by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential global leaders. So if, if I'm to understand, if I'm to uh, appreciate your argument today, the, his work and the work of his team and the people behind him are um ill-advised or they're incorrect or they're wrong or they're or something else that's driving them 
and their work. Is that is that what you're asking us to to accept? I'm I'm, I'm not familiar in any. I know who Jeffrey Sachs is. I'm not familiar with what he's doing or his recent research. The point is, I'm very familiar with the UN reports and the Paris Agreement and the Conference of the Parties and the UN Sustainability Goals. Okay. The UN climate stuff is at odds with its own sustainability goals. In 2015, the world's governments and all the leaders got together and they agreed on 17 global sustainability goals. The first one is to eliminate global poverty. The second one is to eliminate global food, uh, global hunger. And then somewhere number seven is uh, clean, abundant energy for all. And number 13 is climate action. Okay, somehow climate action has been elevated as the most important thing in the world. Forget eliminating poverty, forget food security. The most important thing is climate action. Farmers can't get enough fertilizer to grow their crops because it produces CO2 emissions. Does this make sense? No. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the name of sustainability and climate change policy that has nothing to do with sustainability or human well being or economic development. It's in fact acting counter to reduction of poverty and food security. Well, interesting argument. Um, what what are the what are the forces that are driving this phenomenon from your perspective? Well, you have to go back to the 1980s to understand this. And again, the UN Environmental Program, they long have had a goal and an interest in world government, um, anti-capitalism, um, disdain and dislike for fossil fuels. Okay. And once the, the global warming argument was put forward, the CO2 emissions, um, they latched onto this as the vehicle for pushing those policy goals forward. Okay, and this was like in the 80s when they latched onto this. Um, and in 1992, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change had their big treaty. Um, we must prevent dangerous anthropogenic climate change. And this was before there was even any hint of warming. There had been decades of cooling, <laughs> okay? So there, there wasn't even any warming yet. It was just all theoretical and driven by a political agenda. So the, the policy cart was way out in front of the scientific horse on this. Okay, then the IPCC came along and the first IPCC assessment said, well, we don't see anything beyond natural climate variability. Okay, well, <laughs> the UN uh, Framework Convention did not like that. And the existence of the IPCC itself was on the line. So for the second assessment report, the report looked just like the first one. Okay, we're not really seeing anything yet. And tremendous pressure was put on the scientists in the summary for policymakers meeting where the scientists meet with the policymakers. And that was when science, they, the scientists came up with, we have this seen a discernible impact of emissions on warming of the climate. So this discernible, and then they, this was after the report had all been written, and then they went back and changed the report to be consistent with this. And this was an enormous scandal in scientific circles, but politically it served a purpose and the IPCC was able to remain its relevance and its viability. So in these very early days, you can see how politics influenced the science. The whole scientific problem was framed very narrow. Let's look only at CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions, forget natural climate variability, and let's focus only on what be, might be dangerous. We don't need to concern ourselves with any benefits of a warmer climate. So all of climate science began to be framed in this very narrow way. 
That's where the funding was for research from natural governments to support the efforts of the IPCC. And the IPCC third and fourth assessment, they were both the absolute worst. It was just pure political advocacy. Um, then after that climate gate struck and the IPCC was put under a lot of scrutiny and they cleaned up their act to some extent for the fifth and sixth assessment report. The fifth assessment report, uh, the working group two on impacts and working group three on mitigation, they were relatively good. The IPCC six assessment report, the working group one on the science and the physical basis was quite good. Working group two and working group three were not. So it's a very mixed bag. It depends on who gets selected to be authors and lead authors. And these authors are selected with, you know, a political agenda in mind. Um, you know, it, it's not, <laughs> not necessarily, I mean, someone like me, well, I was actually a reviewer for the third, a minor contributor and a viewer for the third assessment report. So I did my thing. Um, but when I read the report, I was just disgusted. And so that, at that point, I didn't have anything more to do with the IPCC. But the whole thing is very politicized. But that said, the IPCC reports are a relative voice of reason compared to what the activists are saying, you know, extinction and code red and all this kind of emergency. Well, I'm sorry, that's just not on. The climate crisis isn't what it used to be even two years ago. The large emission scenario, apologies for the lingo, RCP 8.5, if that's familiar to any of you, that one is now off the table. The Conference of the Parties 26 and 27 are no longer considering that extreme emission scenario. Two or three years ago, a warming of three or four degrees since the pre-industrial period would have been regarded as policy success because everybody was worried about this really extreme emission scenario and all the extreme weather that might be associated with. Well, now everybody's back down to the reference, which is RCP 4.5, which is a much more modest increase and has much more modest impacts. Okay, we're in reach of two degrees. I don't think we're gonna have a problem staying within two degrees centigrade by the end of the 21st century. No, we've already warmed by 1.1 degrees. I don't think we're gonna have a problem staying within another nine tenths of a degree centigrade. Now that it's in sight, they've moved the goalposts down to 1.5 degrees to amp up the urgency to do this, to do that. So these targets have nothing to do about with science, they have to do with politics and efforts to achieve the maximum ac action to get rid of fossil fuels. And it's not just about getting rid of fossil fuels, it's all about renewable energy. They don't want nuclear either. So it, it's, a, it's a very specific worldview that is being put forward here that has very little basis in actual science and sensible energy policy. Very interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. I suppose um, I'd like to ask about the alternatives because it, it, what you're saying here is a, is a political uh, issue. It's a political argument. So what are the, some of the alternatives? What do you think can be done about this? And I, I should say that to a non-expert outside observer, I suppose you are aware that uh, a person who is in the minority in this argument is also difficult to, to, to sort through the complexity here. And there's only, there's only a few people, right? Because the overwhelming majority of, of climate experts do not agree with, with this take. Is, is that correct? So not at all. No, I, okay. I don't think that's true at all. Okay. There's a okay. lot of very vocal people out there. Okay, some of them even have press agents, <laughs> okay, publicity agents, scientists. You know, to me, that's completely antithetical to being a science. So there's a lot of 
people with big voices and big mouths out there. But if you look at the rank and file, um, scientists, people realize most people, most sci most people who really understand the processes of how the climate works, geologists, meteorologists, oceanographers do not disagree with what I'm saying. Okay, we have oversimpl. They understand that we've oversimplified the climate problem, and people in the policy world. Many of them agree that we've oversimplified the solution. Okay, you can't unring this bell, even if we were to somehow get rid of CO2 um, emissions. There's a lot of inertia in the climate. Okay, it would be 100 years, 50 years before we saw any change in the weather. Sea levels would continue to rise. The ice sheets would be doing what they're doing. There's very long time scales. So this urgency to cut emissions isn't really going to help the weather at all. Now, once you take the urgency out of the equation for reducing emissions, then you're in a very different place in terms of thinking about policy. Okay. Um, I am a strong proponent of a new vision, better vision for 21st century energy infrastructure. Okay. With new ideas, new technologies, whatever, cleaner, cheaper, more secure, more reliable, etc. I am absolutely all in favor of that. There are many reasons not to continue relying on fossil fuels. I mean, by the end of the 21st century, it's going to be very expensive to extract anyways. But there's, you know, all sorts of political, geopolitical instability associated with fossil fuels as we're seeing play out in with the Russian, Ukraine and Western Europe situation. So there's lots of reasons not to like fossil fuels. Okay, but there is no way on earth that wind and solar is the answer. Wind and solar is very low power density. It requires a lot of land, not just for the power plants themselves, but also for the transmission lines that are required. It's very materials intensive, enormous amount of copper, cement, steel, and on and on it goes. Um, renewable energy is very, vulnerable to the vagaries of weather and climate variability. If we're worried about CO2 impacts on the weather, okay, why on earth would we pick an energy system that is exceptionally vulnerable to weather variability? Wind droughts, floods, hail, lightning, the whole works. I mean, why would we subject our energy supply to that? Okay, so what should we be doing? Well, there's, the US is making tremendous advances in small nuclear reactors, small modular nuclear reactors with all sorts of advanced technologies. These are just starting to come online. There's a learning curve, but within 10 years, these are going to be really a wonderful solution. Advanced geothermal is also a very promising solution. It doesn't work everywhere, but in locations where they have the right resources, it can be a very good source. Um, to me, those are the two solutions that I would hang my hat on, you know, with for the 21st century infrastructure. Yeah, we will probably need fossil fuels for a while. But the thing about the energy transition is we need to understand that we're going to need a lot more energy in the 21st century, not just to bring countries like in Africa up to snuff in terms of having access to grid electricity, but we're trying to electrify everything, you know, with heat pumps and electric vehicles and all this kind of thing. But more fundamentally, electricity provides a source of all our societal innovations, robotics, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, new materials, et cetera. So, you know, we're just going to need a lot more electricity. And there is no way, even if you could work out the technology 
relevant technologies for wind and solar to keep it reliable and whatever, there's no way we have the land use the, that would support an awful lot of wind and solar power. So, so that's the fact of it. I mean, so much of this is driven by the desire for a particular political solution kneecap the fossil fuel companies, you know, just kill the fossil fuels. That's a top priority. Okay. And then bring in wind and solar. I mean, that's the solution. That's not going to help anybody. It's going to give us less reliable electricity, which is going to reduce um, our economic development, which means we have less money to actually um, protect ourselves from extreme weather events. A lot of, if we have a lot of electricity, we can run desalination plants, uh, indoor or vertical agriculture. We can build all the infrastructure to protect our cities or whatever. We can manage floodplains, we can smart grids to um, increase the reliability of electricity. So, I mean, electricity is so central and here we are destroying the infrastructure <laughs> that we that has built the prosperity of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century. And we're destroying it without having a viable replacement. And this makes absolutely no sense. This is not the way to support human thriving and flourishing. Can I ask you how receptive have have your critics been to engaging in dialogue with you? Oh, they won't debate me because <laughs> I'll clobber them. They won't debate me. No one will debate me. Um, really? Well, we've no. had on the channel, we've had on the channel in the past, uh, uh, he's not a climate scientist, but he's written a book about climate science. And that's Lawrence Krauss, a theoretical physicist. Yeah, I know who he is, yeah. Would you be interested in, in talking to him, discussing these issues? Oh, um, I, I'm game to debate and discuss with anybody. Oh, okay. fantastic. That's good news. That's good news. Uh, absolutely. Great. No, that this is one of the, uh... <laughs> yeah. The... Well, that's good news. Okay, but, okay but, but you have to tell him who he would be talking to because I've had debates scheduled and then people my opponent, who might have been invited first, they then canceled when they, when they saw that they were going to be going up against me. Oh, wow. So if you're going to invite okay. anybody to debate me, get a signed okay. agreement. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. This has happened no, that's before. very good. That's very good. Well, okay. well I, I love the confidence. That's, that's fantastic. Okay, can, for this final part, can we transition to some of your um, professional activity now that you are not no longer in academia? and uh, where people can learn more about what you're doing these days. Okay, I'm pres I founded a company, Climate Forecast Applications Network, cfanclimate.com. And this is basically about helping our clients manage, understand and manage their weather and climate related risks. We make weather type forecasts, you know, temperature, wind power, you know, related to the weather uh, energy sector, hurricane forecasts. A lot of our income comes from extended range hurricane forecasts, particularly um, insurance companies and also electricity utility companies that live in coastal, that serve coastal regions. Also do a lot of more climate related consulting. Um, we make projections out to 2050, give them a range of scenarios of what could happen out to 2050 in terms of extreme weather events. And this is a much broader range of scenarios than you would get from the IPCC. We also include natural climate variability. Um, I've recently completed a book titled Climate Uncertainty and Risk. It's in press. Um, the publisher is Anthem Press. It's probably another seven or eight months before it will be published. And this is a holistic look at the whole problem, you know, the, the pernicious issue of how this has become politicized, how and why, philosophy of science, 
is, comes in. And then the middle section is really about just looking at what could happen in the 21st century and what we don't know, okay, about what could happen. And then the third part is related to um, risk science, decision-making under deep uncertainty, adaptation, and energy, you know, a vision for the 21st century energy system. So, so a lot of territory covered in the book. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, be interesting when it comes out, but you know, a lot of what I'm talking about here kind of things are covered in, but it's a, it's an academic book. It's not like a, a rant, <laughs> you know, like some climate books are that this has like several thousand academic references. Um, you know, it, it's a scholarly book and it's published by an academic press. So it's, it's not a political rant, like so many climate books to well, me. That sounds, that's what they are. that sounds very interesting. Uh, I look forward to the possibility of having you back if you're interested when the book oh, comes absolutely. out. We'll take absolutely. a deep dive. We'll take a deep dive into that. And I'd like to also continue on two fronts. One is get somebody who's willing to talk to you, who's a critic of these points of view, Hopefully it'll be um, uh, Lawrence Krauss. It would be, I think it would be very interesting. And the next front, which we ran out of time today, which I think is probably more important, is how we resolve these differences of interpretation and different differences in scientific outlooks, how we resolve these issues politically, which is a separate issue, but I think it's equally or more important than the actual science, because uh, oh. ultimately we have, we have to decide how, how to proceed and how how the planet's going to evolve. And it's, it's just so critical, these, these questions. Well, I agree, absolutely. At this point, that there's the science is almost irrelevant at this point. Um, it, it's really more about the decisions we need to make. And th this is what this last third of my book is about, decision-making under deep uncertainty. What do you do when you've got different perspectives? Well, you, you search for no no regret solutions you under you know do lots of experimenting and bring in a lot of stakeholders and decision makers and try to come to some sort of an agreement it's it's a wicked problem and the ways with dealing with a wicked problem are not top down un mandated kind of solutions so there are better ways to approach finding solutions to this very, very super interesting, super interesting. I think we could we could probably go on for a, at least a couple more hours just on that topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, we'll, we'll put it on hold for the moment. Uh, I've really enjoyed this talk. To be honest, I'm actually surprised at how much I've enjoyed the talk and the potential for for some really valuable exchanges down the line. So I look I look forward to that, Doctor. Thank you much so much for taking. Okay. Well, the time. thank you. I look, I look forward to a continuing dialogue. To support our discussions with the world's leading thinkers, please see the video description or visit eism.eu forward slash support. Thank you.